You're listening to P-R-O-X. I gotta, I gotta feel, you know how actors yeah. like feel like they gotta, you know, really be in the person before they can start really acting. Like they gotta really like know the person. Yeah, I feel like that as a writer. Totally. I feel like yeah. that as a writer. I gotta, I gotta know it. I mean, even, and I think that's more important actually than structure and all of the other stuff that I do have to do. But, you know, all of that is like me, like, you know, getting that figured out. But can you actually be in this place and, and, and convince yourself that you're there? Forget other people. Do you believe it? Yes. Do you believe this happened? You know what I mean? Like, that's that's kind of what you got to do. You're listening to In Proximity. This is the second part of a conversation between writer ta Coates and Proximity founder Ryan Coogler. If you haven't listened to part one, you may want to press pause right here. Go back to the previous episode and check it out. Then come back here when you're done. Last episode, ta shared a little bit about his early writing experiences and the impact of hip-hop on his work as a writer. On this episode, ta and Ryan dive into ta writing process, their shared experiences in writing the character of T'Challa, the Black Panther, pivotal moments in their life and work as artists, and of course, their Pox Rex. Just in terms of process, man, because you've been writing for, for, like, you've been a professional writer, bro, for how long? Most of my life. Because when I, because I remember when I, when 27 I'm, years. 27 years. 27 years. I remember years. when I met Chadwick for the first time. I mean, in some sense, longer, but yeah. Yeah, I remember when I, when I met Chadwick for the first time, and I, I mentioned you, and he was the first person to tell me how to say your name the right way. Because mm. I, I think I want to pronounce it Tanahishi. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, I know Tanahashi. <laughs> that's, a, that's the most chad shit ever. <laughs> yeah, he just fixed it for me. <laughs> right, 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 right. Subtly. Yeah, he fixed it real subtly, but firmly. You know what I'm saying? And um, mm. he mentioned like that people knew you were really good at writing, like, and you kind of he kind of said it like you went pro early. Mm. You like went to the pros early or whatever. You know, like while everybody was kind of still in school, you kind of went pro. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, to extend the metaphor. Uh, you know, it's like you failing out of school, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's what happened. You know, I wasn't I wasn't a good student. I was a terrible student, and yeah, I was just I was a really bad student, Cook. Um, what do you mean by that, bro? I mean, I mean, if you want to get it particularly deep with it, what I now realize is I was like ADHD, ah, uh, um, und- undiagnosed. Definitely. I mean, that wasn't really a thing that was like. And you've been di- you've been diagnosed since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. I have. Um, and I knew it. It was a point when I knew it. And then I was like, all right, I'm just going to, you know, go on with my life. And then I, you know, actually relatively recently talked to somebody and they was like, yeah, that's that's you right there. I could not sit in a classroom and listen to somebody talk for an hour and a half. Which is, which was my Tuesdays and Thursdays in college. You know? what, 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 what would you find yourself doing? Oh, I'm thinking about other things. I, I, mine's going all kinds of places. You know, and then I got to sit down to do a paper and my mind is going like 50 different places. And, you know, the language mm-hmm. we had for back then was, are you lazy? You know what I mean? Uh, are you lazy? You know, and that was like the, the book on me when I was in school. You know, I was a, I was, I was a terrible high school student and, and, you know, middle school student. You know what I mean? A really elementary school student, probably. Um, it's like Otanahasi is really, really, really smart. He reads so much. But he's so lazy. He just, he's not living up to his potential. He's not. And that was like the yeah. constant, constant thing. And so I got to college and it was like, I was interested in everything that was, I was interested in the classroom sometimes, but I was interested in everything outside of the classroom. But not like normal. I mean, I was just likely to go in the library and just read a book, you know, for myself. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I was just as likely to do that. And so something... Something just wasn't fitting. And it, it took a long time for me to, you know, realize I probably wasn't going to get my degree. You know, I was in and out. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was back, yeah. you know. So what Chad was talking about, you going pro, was from your perspective, was kind of out of necessity. I was forced. I was forced. Wow. You know what I mean? I grew up in a, in a kind of household where you wasn't going to really come back. So, you know what I mean? You got you got, you got got to make a way. And so probably the first thing was um, I got published really early. Yeah. Like I published poetry like my in like an actual book that somebody else put together, like an anthology, like my freshman yeah. year. 
Because cause, cause that's how he phrased it. He didn't phrase it like you were like a bad student. He said you were so good. Yeah, he wouldn't have known that, you, that though. That, he wasn't in that, class that you, with me. He was in fine arts. That's what so. I'm saying. But he, but, he, but he said like the, like the rap on you around campus was that you were really great, like this great writer. That's what who, they would have seen. That was the exterior. That's wild, bro. But you know, the interior <laughs> is, yo, I'm fucking up. Like, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, wow. I'm fucking up my life right now. You know what I mean? Like, my parents wow. sent me to do one thing and I'm really not doing it. And I, and it's like, you always tell people you really should not write unless you feel like you got no other choice on some level, wow. yeah. on some level. Like, you know what I mean? Like, cause it's just, I don't, and that's how I felt. I felt like I didn't have any other choice. So I started, you know, I published poetry. I actually started in journalism at the student newspaper, which I loved. And then we had a kind of alternative paper uh, in DC called Washington City Paper. I, I, I started, and you asked me like when I, so I was 20 years old when I, when I got my first like job there. Um, that Jesus. was twenty seven years ago. That, Jesus. And um. So so you've worked you've worked professionally as a writer for longer than you haven't. At this point. Yeah 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 definitely definitely and 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 to be clear like as a writer and I'm I'm making this delineation but very specifically as a journalist and the reason why I'm making that delineation is because when you're a journalist you have to go out and talk to people like interview people and like dude I can't even legally drink. But wow. I would you go and you, you interview. Yeah, you can't even meet somebody at a bar. I can't meet somebody at a bar. But I would interview like people like, you know what I mean? Like literally twice, three times my age. You wow. know what I mean? And you have you gotta formulate questions. Like you gotta really like think about like why. Like you can't just because they won't respect you if you don't do that. And what was your process like? What was you prep before you went in? I did. I did. I, I at that point, you know, and at that point, like internet is just beginning, but it can't really be depended upon. At the public library in Washington, where I was in school, they had something called Washingtonia, which was like basically an archive of everything written on Wash local Washington, D.C., the city. I'm not talking about the capital. I'm talking about local Washington, D.C. And I just would yeah. spend hours down there. I spent hours reading whatever, you know, to make sure I was informed, informed. And I didn't even perceive it as work. It was like, who wouldn't want to do this? Who wouldn't want to sit here and just, you know, be able to, hey, can you bring me that? Hey, I'd like to see that. Hey, this was published. Can you bring this over here? You know what I mean? And get wow. to just sit there and absorb the information. So, um, you know, it's funny, man. My wife, before we were even dating, she, you know, though we knew each other, she has a story about how she was like cutting on TV one day. And she looks, and it was this show that used to come on uh, called Evening Exchange. And it would be like whatever the debates that were going on in the city. And she cut on the TV and she said, yo, that's ta <laughs> And I was on TV because I had written this story. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> like, That's I awesome, this. bro. And she, you know, she popped the VHS set. She was like, oh shit, I got to pop the VHS set. You know, she's back it. in yeah, the I gotta day. Tape this. Yeah. I got to tape this. Uh, you know what I mean? Ain't no YouTube. I got to tape this real quick. And she had it for years. You know what I mean? And um, I, I, I had written about why we couldn't get a um, what we now have, but a, a, a Museum of African American History at the Smithsonian. And I had done all this report and I wow. talked to all, again, you know, people three times, people who are actually gone at this point. You know, three times and, older. And, 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 that, and, and, what you, and what you're talking about exists now. It exists now. And in fact, one of the guys I interviewed for that story, Lonnie Bunch, was the first dude to run it. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's how long I've been writing. Man, that's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible, bro. Yeah. I was a child, Coog. I was a child. Bro, I was younger than my son is right now. <sighs> that's how young I was. Jesus. Talk about uh, the transition in the in the fiction, mm -hmm. you know, because I don't, I don't want to call it creative writing because journalism is, is as yeah, creative as yeah. it gets, especially some of the some of the things that you've done. And and our and our and an inflection point for me and in our relationship, I want to talk about is like, you know, I was doing a lot of traveling for work when I first got started, made Fruitville, and I got bought by a distributor, and I'm going around the festivals and, and to promote. I spent a lot of time in airports, you mm. know, and I remember um, walking into one of the airport newsstands. I can't remember what airport I was in, but I saw I saw a case for reparations. That was my, like my first intro to you as a as a writer, mm -hmm. you know? And I remember how bold the cover was. Yeah. And it had all your black. name on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all black cover, had your, had your name on there. And the way that it was presented 
was like, I feel like I should know who this guy is. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Because like, because like, yeah, <laughs> it felt like your name was as big as the as the as the uh, as the, you know. And it was and it was like, hey, we got we got this thing from this guy, and it's like, damn, I, don't, I gotta get up on my stuff. I don't, I don't know who this guy is. But I want to read this special edition, so I copped it, and I read it, and man, it was so moving, mm. you know. And it played back into like what I was talking a little bit about with Pac, uh, this feeling that we had like in the, in, the, in, the, in basically our whole lives that like something was afoot yeah, that we couldn't put our finger on. That you can't name. Yeah, like, you know, obviously we were made very aware of the transatlantic slave trade and, mm -hmm. and, and the great migration. No, we didn't, ha we, weren't, we weren't calling it that, you know what I'm saying? But we knew that like, yeah, all our grandparents seem to be from the same place and it ain't here, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but what had happened since, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It was like this thing happening and we were smart, bro. Like I, you know, like I, I was a finance major in college. I couldn't put my finger on like the unfairness of what was happening in the housing crisis. I couldn't put my finger on it, man. Like, like in, in I couldn't put my finger on how there were neighborhoods in Oakland that I had never been. You know what I'm saying? Even though it's like down the street, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a neighborhood over there, man. It, I think it's still Oakland, but like we don't go over there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like what, it, like what's going on there? Mm -hmm. Like, um, and it's nicer and the houses are more valuable. You know, I, I, I hadn't understood what redlining was mm -hmm. and how it was all a part of like the same thing, you know, happening. And how it was this great violation, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like in a country where it's totally understood that, hey, if I do something to you, you know what I'm saying? And, it, and it's proven in the court of law, I have to compensate you for that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's, that's known fact. We operate under that idea and, and nobody had let it out. Like, like, which is beautiful prose, you know what I'm, you know what I'm, you know what I mean? I, I, I was really, um, I was really amazed. And then you took the Panther job, mm -hmm. you know? I think, I think between the world and me became in between those things. Mm -hmm. But, but you, you taking that Panther job was really the big cause of our intersection. Mm -hmm. That was when I asked Jesse Williams to introduce us, mm -hmm. you know, um, cause I was getting ready to take that movie. But, but can you talk a little bit about like, like the transition to writing fiction from being a journalist? I mean, cool. I think it go back to what we talked about uh, where we started at the beginning of this conversation. I think if you coming up don't recognize the lines between things, you know what I'm saying? Like, why would you yeah. as an artist recognize the line between things? You know what I mean? Like, right. why would you say, oh, I can't do that, you know? I mean, obviously you got to master the form and learn it, you know what I mean? But, right. you know, I've been a big comic book fan when I was a kid. When I, when I was a kid, they, there was no ongoing Panther run at the time. So I didn't really know at that point a ton about Black Panther. I was a huge, like, Spider-Man, X-Men fan. And you know what's wild? It was something exciting about the fact that they had called me up. Like on some level, somebody said, oh, you called a black guy to do Black Panther. But actually it was something right. exciting about the fact that they called me up to do something that I didn't have to exist as a fan. Like I didn't right. have memories. I didn't have like these deep, you know what I mean? Fan-based memories. You know, I wrote uh, Panther and, and Captain America for them. You know, it was two mm -hmm. totally different books. But I guess what I would say is, it was no different than the story I just told you about being like 20 years old and sitting in the public library in Washington. It's like, okay, here you go. Go through everything on Black Panther and on T'Challa ever written. And then you come up with a take. Figure out who this guy is. Right. You know? And my take was, this is a dude who spends a lot of time outside of Wakanda. Like a lot. Mm -hmm. Like he was in the Avengers at that point in time, the way the canon worked, he had gone to school outside of Wakanda. You know what I mean? He had taken Daredevil's place for a while. He had all this time. Yeah. Married this woman that wasn't from Wakanda. You know what I mean? Other love interests not from Wakanda. And I was like, does this man like being king? Yeah. I don't think he does. I don't think he does. I think he may recognize it's the thing that he has to do, but I don't think he loved being king. And I was like, oh, okay. All right. And I, I have to be honest. It's interesting. That also kind of, like you said, like case reparations had come out between the world that, and me had come out. What was happening at that point is I was getting some things that I probably had not thought I was asking for. Mm -hmm. But that came with the territory. And um, you you, what you're talking about is like, um, is, is you talking about fame? Uh, for lack of a better term, yeah. yeah. But I think also, more specifically, so when we were working on Between the World and Me, you know, my editor was like, look, we, we got to get, get some blurbs. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't, and blurbs are like advertisement. Like, you know, people say, this is great. This is incredible. Yep. Yep. It's always yep, a pain I'm, in the neck because you got to send shit to a bunch of other writers and ask them to tell the world about how great you are. Right. Yeah. The it's blurb, like, yeah. Yeah. I was like, ah. <laughs> yeah. You know? And he said, okay, all right. 
if you could get it from anybody, who would you get? And I named two people. One of them was uh, El Doctorow, who was like you know one of my idols, and and is one of my idols, even though he passed. And 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 the other was Toni Morrison. You know, what I mean, also was an idol. Right. So I said, they're the only two who I, you know, could really think about who I really, really, you know, feel like it. And I didn't think they was going to do it. You know, it turned out E.L. Doctorow was sick at the time, uh, ended up passing right. away. He couldn't do it. But then we got back this incredible note from fucking Toni Morrison. Yeah. I mean, at, at, you know, at that point, greatest living writer at that point. You know what I mean? Like, really, you yeah. know what I mean? It may have been like, you know, there's one other person I'm thinking about who somebody might have made the case for. But, like... You know what I'm saying? Like you talking like totally. like like you know, incredible. And she says this thing, and she says, you know, look, I you know I think, uh, you know, I've been searching for you know who was going to be James Baldwin. You know who's going to be had a place that James Baldwin had, right? And clearly from this book, it's Ta-Nehisi Coates. And I was like being a dummy. I saw that, and I was like, wow, this is really humbling. This is incredible. This means I really, really got to work hard. I can't ever take no shorts because if Toni Morrison says this, I get... But see, what I didn't understand was how that would be received. Like, outside... From the community. From the community. Yeah, I didn't really... You know what I mean? And, and specifically be from other writers, you know what I mean, in, in my community. It come, it come, it could, it could make you a target for, uh, for some hate. I just say it could make you a target. Yeah. I just say it could make you a target. You know what I'm saying? And I'll just say, you know, it, it it makes you, you know, it definitely makes you a target. And it did. And then the book blew up. And so, like, all of this is going yeah. into, like, me going into Panther. And it's like, well, I love to write. I really, God, I love to write. I really, really do. I love this book. Yeah. I feel great about it. I'm glad a lot of people saw it. But there was a thing going on in terms of how I was regarded, I think, you know, in the community totally. of black writers that I just didn't yeah. love at all. I didn't love it all. Yeah, so I channeled I, 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 a lot of and that. And just clarification for the podcast, man. I'm, I'm, I'm from where, like, the home of player hating as a concept. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and, like, and, like, it's a verb that comes out of jealousy. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. It's really like, so like man, you know, man, they hating. Where we from, it mean, like, man, you jealous of a person. So you you saying things or doing things to disparage yeah. them yeah. out of jealousy because you want their position or you feel like you should have what they have, right. you know? And that's what I mean by hate. I don't mean, like, you know, you're a target for people hating you. But, yeah, like, no, no that's the thing that comes with that's the thing that comes with success, right? It does. The great Denzel Washington told me, he said, you, when you pray for rain, you got to be prepared for the mud. Which I translate as like, when you wishing for a blessing, sometimes a blessing can have unintended consequences. One of the things I've, I've, I've begun to think about is, in what just world do you get something, you get a blessing and it not come with challenges? Like what? What kind of what kind, of what kind of world do you want to live in? Like what? Like what are you? What are you? Are yeah, you what so are you true. asking for? You asking for just strawberry shortcake every day? Then you gotta kind of accept what it is, whether you ask for it or not. And yeah, it's kind of where I came out with T'Challa too. <laughs> you know, like really, wow. it's kind of where I came out with him. You know, right, right. Man, that's that's heavy, man. It, it's a character that I, that I love so much, bro. The the character in in my world, like. I write, you know, whether it's by myself or with a co-writer, you know what I'm saying? On the Panther films, I wrote them with the great Joe Robert Cole. And then you get people to play these roles, you know what I'm mm. saying? And, and, and so, so yeah, I love the character. You know, I love the character that you wrote, the character that Priest wrote, like, mm. you know, Reggie McGregor, you know what I'm saying? Like, Stan, like I, I think he's just an incredible, it's an incredible concept. Mm -hmm. And in that tapestry that, that that of all of the works that have been done around the character, I think yours stands up extremely tall. You oh, know? I appreciate that. I, I appreciate that. You, you just feel so real in your run. And, and But for me, man, like, I think about that character and the impact that that character's had on our lives. You know, yeah. um, and I'll be forever thankful for the opportunity to work with Chad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, cool. I, I, we're all thankful to you, though. And I'm just saying as, as, as comic book writers, you know, um, I just think, bro, it is not an easy thing to translate that to the screen. People don't remember this, but like, let's say before, I don't know how you would date the current era of, of superhero movies, but if you take it, let's say we start with what? Maybe Blade? That's probably that's probably the, the real thing. Probably the first Blade, the Wesley Snipes Blade, maybe. It was a lot of bad superhero movies, dude, and a lot of bad superhero TV shows, and it was not all because they didn't have the special effects yet. You know? It's actually a difficult thing to translate that yeah. into film given what film requires in terms of believability. And I just like, not just the fact that you did it, but what I was talking about earlier, like this need to say something, 
You know what I mean? That you was able to say something through T'Challa, through Njadika also. You know what I mean? It's just not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's yeah. not a small thing. Both of you and Joe, man. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge, huge, huge thing. And then to get people to come see it. Like not in a corner. Well, you know, a few people saw it, <laughs> but like yeah. masses, man. I mean, that yeah. joint, Jesus, it was huge. It is huge. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, for sure, man. And, and but yeah, it, it was, you know, we approached it. Like, I, I'm curious, like you sit down and write something, bro. Like whether it's because you talked about you, you were raised in a household that didn't delineate between different forms of art. It was all treated the same in terms of how it was viewed. And for you, you say like, you know, as a result of that, you can go from journalism to, to fiction and, and back. Is your process the same for each one? Are you sitting down? Are you outlining? Are you asking yourself what you're trying to say thematically before you get started? Like, like what do you, is, is your process I think figuring out what similar? I want to say is, is probably the most important part. I think that's extremely, extremely important. I think... You know what I mean? And then everything kind of flows from there. I was telling my wife the other day, you know, I was working and I was telling her like the act of writing, by which I mean like the act of me just sitting back with a pad and a pen and just trying to take notes is like an act of discovery for me because things come that I didn't even know was there. I usually, whatever I'm doing, I usually read a lot first. I just spend a ton of time reading. You know what I mean? And just think about, well, what am I, you know, what am I feeling? How does this make me feel? What am I seeing here? I usually mark up whatever I'm reading. Right. You know? And that that goes across the board, journalism, fiction, whatever. I always start off reading. You start off reading. You know, you're making notes, you're thinking, you're looking for what you're trying yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, what is, what is really, really, really striking me here? And if it's journalism, then that expands out to actually calling people and talking to people. I mean, in fiction, it might too. Sometimes it does in fiction also, as you know. You know, you might need to interview people to talk to them to get, you know, a, a, yeah. a better sense of things. That that comes into the process. I got to I gotta feel, you know how actors, yeah. like, feel like they got to, you know, really be in the person before they can start really acting? Like, they got to really, like, know the person. Yeah, I feel like that as a writer. Totally. I feel yeah. like that as a writer. I got I to gotta know it. I mean, even and I think that's more important, actually, than structure and all of the other stuff that I do have to do. But, you know, all of that is, like, me, like, you know, getting that figured out. But can you actually be in this place and, and and convince yourself that you're there. Forget other people. Do you believe it? Yes. Do you believe this happened? You know what I mean? Like that's that's kind of what you gotta do. Yeah, it's similar for me, bro. Like for Fruitvale, it was a real thing. So I was in like a journalist mode, you know, right. like talking to, right, talking to people who were involved. And then with Creed, I had to, I had to, you know, I grew up playing sports, but I had never boxed before. Mm -hmm. So I had to take, you know, I went to, I, I took boxing lessons. Like went to work, work out at King's Boxing Gym in East Oakland. Mm -hmm. Did you spar, Coop? What What I did, I wouldn't call sparring, bro. Okay. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say no. Yeah, like, cause I, cause I, <laughs> I, I, I say that cause I've taken martial arts before and I've sparred before in other martial arts, like in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and Okinawa Karate, I've sparred before. What I was doing in boxing was not that, mm -hmm. you know, cause mm -hmm. all the, all the, bro, boxing is such a, bro, it's, it's, it's such a uh, degree of difficulty, bro. Like, all the, all the, it wouldn't have been smart, bro, for me to, cause it, it was nobody, it was nobody in that gym that was as much of a beginner as I was, bro. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, and they knew that. Even when we was in there, it was never like we were really going. You know what I'm saying? Did they know you were working on Creed at that point? Did, did they know? Like, like were they aware of what you were doing? It was people in there who knew who I was. Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of my old football homies was in there okay. uh, who had turned to boxing okay. like as a way to stay in shape. They know I was a filmmaker. They didn't know I was making a Rocky movie, mm -hmm. you know, but they, but they knew it had to have been something that brought me in there that wasn't right. like, oh, I'm just trying to learn how to fight now. You right. know what I mean? Right. Like the act of doing that is what gave me the, the real, the, really like what I was trying to say with the movie, I think, you know, mm -hmm. um, I kind of knew it would be father and son and, and this question of masculinity and later on identity, but like what we were saying with the fight scenes, you know what I'm saying? Like what we were actually articulating is that in this sport, you are on your own. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you got somebody in a corner talking to you or whatever that you can hear. But when you in that, 
it's no teammates. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying. It's no, you know, and you in there with the same four things that other person has, which is like two feet and two hands. You know what I mean? Mm. And bro, when you in that ring with somebody who knows what they're doing, but that ring is a phone booth. Mm. You know, what I'm, you know what I mean? Like, it's, mm. cause cause you could get, you could kind of get anywhere at any time. You know what I'm, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And them rounds, bro, they last forever, bro. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, just in mm. terms, of, just in terms of endurance, man. So like, it's so much more than just fighting. The closest thing to it is chess. I would say, mm. you know, like the closest thing to it is chess. Mm. On like the world's most relentless treadmill. You know what right. I mean? Right. You know, that's why I call it the sweet science or whatever. But I had to get in there to, to learn it, to understand it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I, I can actually see what you're saying and how the camera moves. Yes. In those scenes now. You know, like you, you totally, totally see it and how, how how it's shot. I mean, I, I mean, I, you know. But but, but also um, like the, the, the one take fight that we did, that yeah. was that was directly yeah. as a result of, of my experience in there and realizing like I want the audience to feel like how long around these. You know what mm. I'm saying? Mm. Like. Mm. And if a other person has your number, like what it's like to try to survive, <laughs> like till you, till mm-hmm. you, you know what I'm saying, till you get back to the other side of the ring. And, mm-hmm. and also what it's like to like, in the sound mix, to like still be trying to hear your coach talking to you while you're getting your yeah, ass beat. Yeah, yeah. You, know yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you can really only do that with like an unbroken take. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that movie, dude. <laughs> oh, right on. <laughs> I done told you like a hundred times. <laughs> right on. <laughs> We tore our Prox Rex segment of the show, man, and, and man, it's been a fun one, you know, hanging out with my, with my big bro, Coach. And this is when we kind of recommend something for the audiences at, at home. I'm going to take an easy way out on this one. And um, I'm gonna recommend Beautiful Struggle, uh, which is which is which is um which is, which is a no, which is a novel from from from, Ta- from Tanahashi memoir. memoir. Yeah, use the right use the right <laughs> phrasing. But you, but you, but but you you you'll hear about a lot about how he came up and the inflection points in his life that led him to be um one of our most celebrated writers um today. You know, you laughing, bro. This is serious, man. Like, I, got, I, got, you know, that's, that's a, it's a, that's a big, rec- big recommendation for. for, for I me. really, really, really appreciate that. I'm, yeah. I'm laughing because, uh, let me just say, I'm humble. I'm absolutely humble. I'm absolutely humble. I think, uh, cause of the uh, field we're in. When I, when I first uh, met Ryan Kuglo, when we first, I guess when we start, you know, really, you know, talk, speaking as friends, he said one time to me that he had this dream of. Hollywood being like the NBA, which is to say the sheer number of black filmmakers in it, you know, really doing it. And uh, I got on the phone. I said, well, I won't say the language I said, but (laughs) he said to sum it up in polite language, I said, this man has lost his faculties. Um, (laughs) But I, it stuck with me, right? Like you saying that actually, actually stuck with me. And the fact is, you know, we, 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 we probably have more black filmmakers active than at any point. You know, not to say the struggle is over, but we do. It, it, it stuck with me so hard. And, you know, as has been a theme in this conversation, whenever we start talking about stuff, it's never confined to like whatever art form you're talking about. Like it becomes like a bigger conversation about the art itself. And so um, I'm going to recommend the essays of a gentleman by the name of Elaine Locke. Um, Elaine Locke was a philosopher. He was the articulator, really, of the philosophies of the literary movement, the Harlem Renaissance, taught at Howard University. I took my first... English classes in uh, Locke Hall, named for Elaine Locke, uh, where he taught uh, for many years. And I found myself going back to read things that I read when I was a younger person. And what happens is, in the great ones, things that you now just take as religion, things that you just take as laws of the world, as just truth, you can hear folks saying it a century before. And so mm. recently, you know, I read this essay from Elaine Locke, and I just, I just want to read this, this short quote, Cougar. I think I sent this to you because it just made me think of you and, and, and what you told me. And Elaine Locke writes, all classes of people under social pressure are permeated with a common experience. They are emotionally welded as others cannot be. With them, even ordinary living has epic depth and lyric intensity. And this, their material handicap, is their spiritual advantage. Mm. 
So in a day when art has run to classes, cliques, and coteries, and life lacks more and more a vital common background, the Negro artist, out of the depths of his group and personal experience, has to his hand almost the conditions of a classical art. And what that brother is saying is because of how much we've been through, we got the material to do like really, 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 really great things because you can't be black in this world or you can't be among any class that was outside of this world and come to an art form and have nothing to say. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I just, I, I think, cool, I think about your work, you know, all the time with that. You know what I mean? And I think about what you told me, you know, all those almost 10 years ago now, you know, with that. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that, Coach. That's, that's beautiful, man. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, thanks for taking the time to be with us here on, on Air Proximity. We appreciate All you, good. bro. All good. Thank you, bro. In Proximity is a production of Proximity Media. If you like the show, be sure to follow, rate, and review it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And tell your friends and loved ones to do the same. Seriously, you can do that right now. Send a link to someone who you think might really like this conversation. Learn more and read transcripts of this episode and others, and get a link to Wakanda Forever, the official Black Panther podcast on proximitymedia.com. Don't forget to follow at Proximity Media on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. The show is produced by me, Paula Mardo. Executive producers are Ryan Kugler, Zinzi Kugler, Sevohanian, and me. Our theme song and additional music is composed by Ludwig Gorenson. Ken Nana is our sound designer and mix engineer. Paulina Cherizova is our production assistant. Audio editing for this episode is by Cedric Wilson. Special thanks to the whole Proximity Media team and to you for listening to In Proximity. Meet you back here next week. The owners of the gym knew, but but I mean, yeah, it was, it was no real sparring happening, bro. Like no no real mm. rounds with catch that was in there, but I'd have been knocked out. It's really hard. It's a really really hard sport. People don't under they think you just fight. Yeah, I'd have been knocked out. <laughs> <laughs>